All right, guys. I have uh, spent a lot of time trying to condense um, the main key components to all of our units in one document. It's quite lengthy, but it's as condensed of a document as I could provide for the key courses to a whole college class. So let's go through it. I'm not going to do all of it, but it talks to you kind of just through the units. So you're going to have to read this. Now here in 2020, you can actually use this on your exam. So, you know, it's almost 20 pages, so you may not want to print it, but you could have it on your computer and have the document and you could scroll through it. Um, in fact, it's as a PDF and you know that you can search PDFs uh, if you wanted to. So if you pulled up a PDF, there's a search panel that you um, that you could pull up and then it would uh, be able to search for particular keywords. Okay, so that might help you um, with your timing on the free response questions. So here our unit one is um, just our one variable data. Okay, uh, the key, I tried to lay out the keys here, the different types of graphical displays. I didn't show you pictures of those. You'd have to go back to the unit reviews on those to look at all the specifics. The connection between center and spread and shape. Um, when you use what particular shape for what particular type of um, spread and because of the resistance to outliers and um, how the mean, median, and mode compare to their shape as well. The outlier rules, how transformations just affect um, the addition and subtraction affects center, your mean and medians, and only multiplication and division affect your spread. All right, describe the distribution, your shape, outlier, center, and spread, and have a little information there. But make sure if they compare two distributions, then which I could see them getting a lot of bang for your buck on an AP FRQ. If you compare it, make sure you use comparative language, higher than, this one's more than, less than, and be specific on what those values are, that they're mean, medians, or whatever. Here was just some basic normal model stuff. Sometimes you guys ask me which, you know, the negatives, <clears throat> infinities, and positive infinities. So I have some pictures of lower in the middle and upper areas and how you norm CDF those. Remember if they ask you for z-score from, they say, what's in the 90th percentile? Percent is not the z. 90th percentile does not mean your z-score is 0.9. Percent is not the z. It's not the z. Use area below to calculate that z-score. It's inverse norm of the area below is the z at that spot. Don't forget your six. Oh, that's poo, 68. 95, 99.7. I'll have to fix that. 68, 95, 99.7 rule within one, two, three standard deviations. All right. The next unit has a lot of information. Seem to be one of our weaker ones. Um, our two variable data. Our scatter plots are what shape is the relationship between the items. So um, remember that if you're talking about the What's the association? It's tell me if it is a strong, positive, negative, linear, or nonlinear, um, and if there are any outliers or unusual features. Okay. So vocabulary-wise, I've listed some things here. Um, so you know you have. There's no way around it. You have to know these definitions. Keep in mind extrapolation. Far, making that prediction far outside, interpolation, what that is, and then you've really got to know this residual material, that that least squares regression line is the smallest sum of those squared residuals. That went where we had a residual, okay, and then we would make a square from it, and where those squares added up to be the smallest. Uh, don't forget, you need to look at the residual plot to see if the data is linear or not. And if the pattern is what you see, then you must say, yikes, the pattern in the residual plot, therefore linear, is not appropriate. Um, now this is interesting. 
your correlation, this proportional relationship of the da actual data points around the line does not change if you add, subtract, multiply, divide. You could even switch the X and the Y. And that correlation, that proportional relationship, that strength of linearity does not change. So that's important. Know how to read those computer printouts. I don't have a picture of one here, but you must be able to find these items, that slope, those coefficients, slope, y-intercept, coefficient of determination, that's your r squared they put on there. And then they just, you can square root it and get the r, the correlation coefficient represented by the r. Okay, and then standard deviation of residuals and um, interpreting that. All right. Um, now, when I was helping my son with some of his review, he was like confused on when you're using one variable stats, when you're using one variable stats of L1 with L2's frequency, that kind of stuff. So I wrote this up here. If you're doing just one variable stats, so say you just have one list of heights, then you just do one variable stats. And it would give of that list of, oh, this is the 35 students number of siblings, okay? So just one set of data, you just do one variable stats. But suppose, okay, and then it, what if we want to say we want to get the expected value? Well, we know expected value is the mean. Expected value is the mean. But what if we had this? So this is the number of siblings and the proportion of the population that have those. So that's these list one pieces of data with list two's frequency. So know when to use, so, okay, so then we would do L1 with L2's frequency. All right. Then the third item is what if they ask you, now this isn't, would not be the case here because this is a list of one set of data and their frequency. But if we had two separate variables of information, like um, age of the student and the number of siblings, See, that's two separate variables. Then, and we were asked if there's a linear relationship between those, okay, then we would do stat calc lin reg, and that would then give us the least squares regression line, your R and your R squared, making sure that your um, stat diagnostics are on. All right. Now, let's look at what's on the formula chart for some things in this these units. So first of all, this is the first part of the formula chart. This looks very confusing. All it is is add them up, divide by n. That's the average. That's it. This one is the correlation coefficient, the r value. That's just talking about how they get that proportional relationship. We didn't ever compute that by hand either. Here is standard deviation by hand, which we did compute this by hand. Remember also that variance, um, variance is the standard deviation squared. Okay. All right. Uh, but we never, we didn't go into doing this by hand. I know some universities do, but we didn't. Now, what's left? You have your y equals mx plus b. Notice that the letters used on these formula charts are not the typical M and B, they are A and B. And interestingly enough, B is the slope. A is the y-intercept, okay? Which this makes this right here a way to compute the slope if you have your correlation as a standard deviation of the y's and the standard deviation of the x's, okay? All right, so I just wanted to point those items out to you. Um, notation, super important. So pay, walk, go through, walk through all of those. Make sure you know all of those different notations. And again, I said notice that the A is the y-intercept on the formula chart. B is the slope on the formula chart. All right, so there's that. Now we go into sampling methods and experimental design very just vocabulary based. We've gone through a lot of those. My You have the songs. My students typically do well on experimental design. So we're going to keep going on and I'll just quickly go through those. I'll just let you read them. Um, 
paying attention to, uh, and remember we have the thinking maps about what uh, observational studies, who you can generalize to, experiments, who you can generalize to, what conclusions you have the right to make. Can you do correlation or can you say cause and effect? All right. The three different types of experiments, completely randomized, a block, randomized block, where you controlled the trait first and then randomly assigned, or your matched pairs. Okay. And then just a few other little random vocabulary items there. Next, unit four. So here we have some, it's probability and random variables. And I was just thinking before I started this, I'm, I think I might have left off something about combining random variables. I'll look and see if I included that. Hopefully I did. If not, it's definitely detailed in the unit four individual summary. Um, all right, so here we go. So we've got our um, all some vocabulary about being disjoint, mutually exclusive, what that means, no overlap, independent. Um, I do want to point out to you that checking for independence on the formula chart is very important, and I actually added that, and I'll show you in a minute. Now, remember, geometric distributions go until a success. Binomial is like out of a set number of trials. How many successes? So on one of the free responses that we had in AP Classroom, one of the questions, or maybe this was just a sample um, AP question that I had come across last week when we were doing this, but it asked, and I have seen this happen before, and so I didn't want to neglect giving you this information. What actually is making something considered to be a binomial distribution because we talk about it when we first introduce it, but I haven't really stressed it, is that you have binomial, you have those two choices. You either you have a situation where it's a failure or a success. It is or it isn't. You stop at the stop sign, you don't stop at the stop sign. Okay, and then of course your independence of selection of those samples, your number of trials is set. So out of 10 randomly chosen cars. And then the same probability of success for every trial. One's not, the probability of one isn't affecting the probability of the other if they're wearing their seatbelt or not. So expected value is the mean. Know where those are on the formula chart, which I have here. Um, locate on this, you know, you might want to put this on your formula chart if you have it written out, this right here. This is a check for independence. You are checking to see if the fact that B has happened is changing the prob overall probability of A. Here is your conditional on the right and your marginal on the left. Okay? All right. And then we have got these discrete random variables. That's where, you know, your, it's, that's your table. You know, like 0 times 0 0.25 plus 1 times 0.33 or something. When we had this over here, that's essentially this. L1 with L2's frequency. Okay? All right. And um, then, remember, here's our binomial formula. Here is the expected value for binomial. This is the number of items you would expect to happen with this standard deviation. Okay, the number of items out of 10 cars or whatever, out of a set number of chosen cars. Remember your PDF versus CDF. You'll have to look at your specific unit examples to recall those details. Geometric, 1 over P. How many do you expect to go until your first success? All right, notation is important, so there's some of those things there. See, I can tell that I left off in here combining random variables. And so, uh, but I do have that very detailed in the Unit 4 notes, combining random variables. And so I'm going to, on this Canvas page, include, I'll, I'll go ahead and backtrack and put all those documents here as well. But anyway. Sampling distribution is very important to pay attention to population versus the sampling distribution.
when we're talking about this, you really need to be able to pay attention to the difference between the population and the sampling distributions, shape, unusual features, center, and spread. What makes the shape of a sampling distribution different than that of the population? How is its center the same or different? How is the spread? Okay. All right, and so you'll want to read that. Here's uh, the formulas for C, the mean of all the P hats. C is where the population proportion is centered. And here is how spread out those P hats are. Okay, how spread out those P hats are. And then we have the same thing here for our means. The center of all the sample means. The center of all the X bars should be where the population is centered, but it is less varied. The, the standard deviation of all the X bars is that population standard deviation divided by square root of N. Here are some pictures to remind you of if you have a small sample size, how that is not overcoming a problem if you have a problem in the population. Okay. Um, but yet, a larger sample size, and in fact, it's n greater than or equal to 30, okay, will overcome that problem. Just FYI, notice here on the left, if it's already approximately normal as a population, small sample size is okay, because it is still approximately normal. All right. Uh, lots of vocabulary, or lots of... Um, notation here on this. Okay, I did see this vocabulary word creep in uh, this year in several places in AP Classroom that you know your, your P hat that is your estimating it's your point estimator for that population proportion so your sample P your sample P hat C is attempting to be a estimator a point estimator for that population's proportion Okay, and if it's in the right location, then or in the correct, it's unbiased. If it's way out there, then it's a biased point estimate, estimator, which could be due to several things. All right, and finishing out, here we go into inference. Um, I have definitely need to know how to understand and state and get what this p-value definition is statistically significant, interpretations of confidence interval and confidence level, two different things. Okay, and then your basics of error and power. And then I really just thought this was so valuable. I pulled all of this directly from this these unit reviews. So here's ex actual examples of written out interval and levels including, look here, these like how you would do for two different proportions, okay? And making that connection, you know, and don't forget your zero statement whenever it's about a difference. And then making that connection between if you rejected the null hypothesis, what does that say about the number? Is it in the interval or not? So on, that interval and test connection. And then that um, conditions for one and two proportions. Now we have the means. So this is the same thing for the means, for the two means, that interval and test connection, and then the, the assumptions and conditions for one, two, and here is paired data. The third thing for means is paired. See how this looks different. Do you remember how we did that? So I have some conclusions for you for that and then the conditions and assumptions for paired data. All right and finally that is a courtesy to you I went ahead and tacked on this side-by-side -side comparison of two independent means on the left versus matched pairs so you could see really how I mean how the different notation how the hypothesis statements look different how everything looks different all the way through even the assumptions and conditions and so on and so forth so those are such commonly 
confused items, I wanted to really um, put that there to specify that for you. Okay, um, there it went all the way through the how it looked on the calculator, and that was it. All right, so on your Canvas page, then I'll have this summary, but I think I'll also go ahead and include all of the huge summaries that I had been making all along in the whole AP review so that you've got everything there, not that you would need to pull it all up if you have been studying, okay, but you've got everything right there in one location for yourself. Now, I'm going to do another review of this visual review because that was a document I found from somebody else that I liked a lot. It had a lot of good pictures and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you that in a separate video.